Welcome to this lecture on scene and its structure. As you might remember from earlier lectures, we talked about the beginning, middle, and the end, which is the basic structure. And after the beginning, middle, and the end, the story can be subdivided up into chapters. No one has yet stated any rules about chapters, so chapters could be several scenes, a chapter could be one scene. There's just no rules. I like to think of a novel in terms of 12 to 16 chapters. That way I'll have four chapters for the beginning, four chapters for the end, four chapters to the first half, and four chapters to the last half of the novel. And then a scene could be divided into smaller units. Every scene should have a beginning, middle, and end. And that scene could also be divided into beats. We'll talk about beats in a later lecture. If you're like me and most other writers, you want people to read your stories. Not only read them, you want them to like them. And more than that, you really want people to be engrossed in your stories. And the best way to do that is to write good scenes. So I hope you'll follow along with me as I examine the basic fundamentals of a scene, what makes a good scene, some of the pitfalls of scenes, and why scenes are important in the total structure of your novel. First, a scene is really very similar to writing a story because a scene is really a miniature story. A scene has a beginning, a middle, and an end. A scene should also have a, a problem. Whereas your story has a story problem, the scene should have a scene problem, which is often referred to as the scene's goal. So let's use an example to kind of help us to get our bearings straight so you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Let's pretend your story goal or the story problem is that the main character must save the family farm from being confiscated by debtors. Depending on the temperament and the makeup of your main character, this person will typically try to explore the different solutions to this story problem, and often each solution will be explored as the goal of one scene. So for example, to save the family farm from debtors, one scene might be that the main character goes to the bank with a goal of trying to obtain a, a loan, a second mortgage on the farm. Of course, as good fiction goes, that's not going to solve his problem, so he's going to have to seek out another alternative. So another scene could possibly be that the main character is going to an old friend for money. Possibly another scene is that the main character might sell a family heirloom that he just hates to part with. So if I was actually writing this story, I'd sit down and brainstorm of all the possible solutions that I could come up with that a person might have to face if they were uh, fighting foreclosure on the family farm. And each scene might explore each one of those topics. Now, of course, some of the topics might be too broad and too large to deal with in just one scene. So you might have to deal with some of the problems over several scenes, and possibly they might be threaded in and out throughout the story uh, that keeps coming up in each scene in one way or the other. For example, uh, maybe one of the solutions is to sell the farm to the next-door neighbor, but the problem with that is the next-door neighbor was mom and dad's enemy. So the main character can't bring himself or herself to emotionally make that decision. So that brings more conflict and turmoil throughout the novel. And you could go on and make a long list of the possible solutions, the possible obstacles that uh, this type of story might face. I'm sure that this same story has been written over and over again. Perhaps uh, one thread or one storyline might be that uh, there's some legality involved. Maybe the family's going to have to give up the farm because of a new roadway that's getting put in, or, or possibly the family's fighting against contractors that are wanting to purchase the land and build condominium. 
So you'd make a list of all the different scenarios that you could come up with. And don't forget to look at the Bible for ideas. As I'm recording this, I'm reminded of Naboth and the vineyard that he wanted. And the Bible stories, of course, have stood the test of time. So uh, they're foundational stories that we all love to hear and hear over and over again. So check out the Bible for stories, and don't be afraid to use those stories. And you won't use them all, you'll just pick out the best. So each one of these scenes would have a scene goal, and that scene goal would be directly related to the story problem. Next, each scene must also have a motivation. And that motivation must be clear to the reader. Whatever the point of view character's goal is for that scene, it should be stated early, very early in the scene, so that the reader can latch on to that. Of course, the ending to a scene can be a cliffhanger, or it can be an introduction of new information. Unlike the story itself, the scene does not have to resolve at the end. Just as we can have different types of paragraphs, we can also have different types of scenes. Sometimes a scene will be just about the relationship, and the relationship is the dominant structure of that scene. Sometimes a scene is all action and things happening, and sometimes the author will introduce a scene that's just kind of laid back and quiet to let the reader kind of catch their breath. And thirdly, every good scene needs to have conflict. Something should stand in the way of the point of view character from reaching that goal that they want so badly. Maybe it's a person standing in their way. Maybe it's circumstances. Maybe it's themselves. Maybe it's something they've done in their past, but there should be conflict. And this goal, motivation, and conflict is the very basis or the very, the very essence of the scene structure. There's two or three things that every scene should have right at the outset. And one is we need to know how much time has elapsed since the last scene. Is this the same day? Is it just another person's point of view and it's the next minute from the last scene? Is it six months later? But somehow early in the scene, the reader needs to know. And it could be something as simple as starting off the paragraph with the next morning. Or someone could be reading a newspaper that gives the date. Or the scene could open in dialogue and, and two people are talking and in their discussion they reveal how much time has elapsed between something that happened in the last scene. But you want to get that time lapse in there early in the scene so the reader can orient themselves. Second, uh, we also have to have early in the scene and as early as possible, we have to know who the point of view character is. And typically, the first name or the first person that's mentioned in the scene, the reader expects that to be the point of view character. Now, there could be exceptions to that, but, but for the most part, that first person that we're introduced to at the outset, we expect to be the point of view character. And thirdly, early in the scene, the reader wants to know the place. What kind of place are we at? Not just that we're in a store, but what kind of store? Is it a shopping store? Is it a grocery store? Is it an old run-down store? Is it busy? What kind of noises are there? What kind of, what kind of sounds? What does the place look like? And the reader wants to be oriented into that world, and we need to help them with that by giving them a description. Now, of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be, in fact, it shouldn't be, a description dump. But early in the story, the writer needs to give a few clues to the reader that they can orient themselves. As you might guess, there's no specific word count for a scene, but I suggest that you do as I've done and pick out your favorite authors and go through and do a word count and see how many words their scenes consisted of. And most of the time you'll find it's around 12 to 1500. There's, uh, it could be 2400, it could be 600 but the average seems to be around 1,200 to 1,500 words in a scene. 
And keep in mind, I can't say this too much, the scene goal has to relate to the overall story goal. They have to be connected. Now, it may not always look like they're connected at the outset, but they need to be connected. Also be aware that your scenes do not all end the same. Sometimes the scenes end on an upbeat. Sometimes they end with a cliffhanger. Sometimes the story goal gets resolved. Sometimes the scene is a, has a negative ending. Sometimes it's a positive ending. Uh, but they can't all end the same or be mundane. There is an important element in the scene structure that every writer needs to understand, and that's that the scene structure actually works by the scene sequel structure. Every scene is not required to have a sequel, but most scenes do have a sequel. What is a sequel? A sequel is that part at the end of the scene where the point of view character processes what has happened, evaluates it, and then makes a decision about what to do next. Usually, that decision is a new goal. Here are three different endings to scenes that I pulled out of my own story. So look at these scene endings and you'll discover that there was dialogue and uh, action happening. At the end of the scene, the main character, or at least the point of view character for that scene, begins to think about things and process what happened. And oftentimes uh, arrive at a new decision. So technically, where a scene has a goal, motivation, and conflict, a, a sequel will have three elements. It'll have a reaction, a dilemma, and a decision. So technically, the character should react to what's happened in the scene. Usually, there's some big problem in the scene. And although the problem may have been worked out or gotten worse, still, toward the end of the scene, there's some kind of new information or uh, something that's brought up, and the main character will have to react to that. What do they think about it? Uh, what are they going to do about it? And so they'll, they'll react to it, and the best scenes will have a dilemma where the main character has no choice, or every choice that they have for making a decision will be a bad choice. So it's like a, a two-pronged situation. Nothing is good about it. And so finally they'll They'll come up with a new decision. Well, I'll have to do this. Either make one of those bad choices or maybe they'll change their mind completely and come up with a new decision that they didn't realize had existed. I've pulled out three examples from scenes of different stories in my own writing for you to kind of look at and get the hang of how the sequel works. Of course, these are not perfect, but these will give you an idea. I suggest that you pause the video and read these over, kind of analyze them, find flaws with them, because there certainly are flaws. Then go to your own writing, some, some writing that uh, you like and admire, and look at the end of the scenes and see if you can find the sequels in the scenes. Every scene may not have a sequel. And then, of course, look at your personal writing and see if you've used the sequel or see how you can uh, use the sequel to your advantage.
Now let's talk about problems in a scene. What's some of the things that commonly show up that hurts a scene? Well, one is the writer puts too many people in a scene. I've actually read well-known classical stories that I've become so confused because there were so many characters in the story. I finally got discouraged with going back and rereading that I got a notebook and just began to keep notes of who was related to who and who this person was. So having too many characters in the story kind of dilutes the story. Keep your characters down to a minimum in each scene. We usually have to have two characters and we often have three. But if you get more than three characters in a scene, it makes it difficult for the reader to keep track of the relationship. So, for example, if you have the main character and then a romance character and then the antagonist, well, you have at least six relationships there. You have the main character's relationship with the romance character and the romance character with the main character. You have the main character's relationship with the antagonist and the antagonist's relationship with the main character. And then you have the two relationships between the antagonist and the romance character and the romance character and the antagonist. So you've got six of these different views of each other, these relationships, and you have to juggle them and keep them straight in the reader's mind. And sometimes that gets difficult. So uh, avoid having too many characters. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having three characters and then you have these walk-on-stage characters or these cardboard characters where the mailman uh, delivers the mail or the pizza boy or the waiter comes in or the clerk, the sales clerk. But for your main characters, keep them down to three, if at all possible, in each scene. Another scene problem is it's so easy for the writer to get off track. I try to do an outline of my novel before I start, and I find that sometimes I get way off on a tangent. There's nothing wrong with that because that may be the direction the story has to go. Uh, you may discover later on that your outline needs to have some diversions, needs to be corrected. Many times those diversions are just a result of the writer getting off track because they can't face and can't handle, can't face or can't handle, can't deal with the real issue at hand there. So be careful that we don't get off track. You as the writer have to make that call, have to make that decision if you're getting off track or not. Other scene problems are unmotivated opposition. Your conflict is not really motivated. There's no real reason behind the conflict. I always say if the main character and the antagonist can sit down and talk about the problem and it's nothing more than just a misunderstanding, then you really don't have a good story problem. The best stories are when the main character believes 100% they're in the right and they have to reach that story goal no matter what. And at the same time, the antagonist is not some big, bad, devilish guy or girl, but perhaps the antagonist is also in the right, and he or she believes that what they are doing is the right decision. And so those make the best stories when sometimes you don't know if you got to root for the antagonist, or sometimes you wonder if the antagonist isn't making the right decisions after all. And another problem in scenes is there's not enough at stake. The stakes aren't high enough. I mean, maybe the whole scene is over some trivial thing that really doesn't matter that much. And if that's true, then you as the writer are the only one that can fix this. You have to look at your scene and say, are the stakes high enough here? Is this important enough? Will the reader care because of what's happening right here? Other problems to look out for is you lose the viewpoint. I've read many students' stories and would-be authors who have problems with viewpoint. They switch viewpoints without even realizing it. So you need to check that. Uh, overblown internalizations. It's easy to make the character the drama queen or the drama king and lose the reader's interest. The readers in today's society are mature readers, 
and they'll catch it right away if the character is overreacting. This might be a, the right time to mention that a good way to up the stakes of your story, and especially your scene, is to include a ticking clock, a deadline. Make it so that the point of view character not only has to reach the story goal or the scene goal, but they have to do it by a certain time, because if they don't, someone will suffer. Or in our case, it's not just a matter of getting a loan for the ranch. Maybe they have to get a loan for the ranch and get it approved in 10 days. And another thing I want to mention is the flashback scene. The writer has every right to use a flashback scene if he or she wants to. However, my stand on the flashback scene is avoid them if possible. First, it takes a fair amount of skill for a writer to be able to transition in a flashback. It's easy to lose the reader and make a stumbling block there when you're going to the flashback and when you're coming back to the present day. That takes quite a bit of skill. It's extra work. Uh, it may not be important, so make sure that it is important. I usually avoid flashbacks if I can at all. If you can't, then of course, write a flashback and do your best at it. But make sure that it's going to add something to the scene or add something to the story. So we've covered a lot of territory in this lecture. I suggest you go back and listen to it again or at least go over your notes and review them. Uh, we've talked about GMC, Goal, Motivation, and Conflict. Uh, that's the very basis, the very structure for your scene. Many writers outline each scene to make sure that their scene has a goal, motivation, and conflict before they even write the scene. We also talked about sequel and how the sequel is related and kind of the structure to keep a scene working. We talked about things to avoid, to watch out for in, in scenes. Uh, it's always wise to go back in the revision process and to check yourself to see if you've made this mistake. There's nothing more embarrassing than to write a scene and practically have it memorized, and then an agent is willing to read your story, and right there in black and white, that agent quickly points out that you've made a blaring error. So uh, make a list of these things to look out for in your stories. Keep a checklist and go back and look them over. I hope that you've uh, learned something or been at least reminded of some things about writing. Uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next lecture.